Hello again, and welcome to Aviation News Talk, a weekly show with relevant news and flying tips for pilots and student pilots to help keep you safe. I'm Max Truscott. For our main topic today, we'll be talking about wind shear, which is a topic that student pilots are required to receive instruction on. We'll talk about what it is, where you may find it, and how to avoid it. Now, last week in episode 142, we talked about aviation news of the weird, as well as some strange iPad incidents. And we did that with friend of the show, Rob Mark, who's a senior editor for Flying Magazine. So if you didn't hear that episode, you may want to check it out. And if you haven't done so already, please click on that subscribe button in whatever app you're listening to us now. That way, new shows will be downloaded to your app as soon as they're available. And it costs nothing, absolutely zero, to hit that subscribe button. So please do it now. This week in the news, the drug rate is rising in pilots of fatal accidents. Textron, which owns Cessna and Beechcraft as furloughing employees. The 2020 CFI of the Year has been announced. And a man was arrested for shooting at a helicopter, and we'll tell you where that happened. All this and more, and the news starts now. From AINonline.com, the NTSB reported that the prevalence of prescription, over-the-counter, and illicit drugs found in the bodies of fatally injured pilots has continued to trend upward since its last similar study in 2014. That 2014 study examined toxicology results from pilots killed in plane crashes between 1990 and 2012. For the updated study, investigators examined toxicology results from pilots who died in plane crashes between 2013 and 2017. Almost all of these crashes, 97%, were in GA aircraft, according to the study. However, investigators noted that a positive toxicology finding didn't necessarily indicate the pilot was impaired at the time of the crash, only that the pilot had used a specific drug or drugs at some point before the fatal crash. Of the 952 pilots fatally injured between 2013 and 2017 with available toxicology results, 28% tested positive for at least one potentially impairing drug, up from 23% in the 2014 study. 15% were positive for at least one drug, indicating a potentially impairing condition, an increase of 3 percentage points from the 2014 study. 10% showed evidence of use of at least one controlled substance, compared to about 8% in the prior study, and 5% tested positive for an illicit drug, an increase from less than 4% in the 2014 study. From AOPA.org and other sources, coronavirus cancellations and postponements. While there have been many of these, you've heard of many of them, so I'm not going to go through all of them. Some of the new ones, uh, EAA announced that the Ford Trimotor Tour is temporarily standing down. They have a tentative date for resumption of the tour of April 16th in Hickory, North Carolina, though that could be changed. They've uh, canceled stops planned for Gainesville, Florida, Apalachicola, Florida, and Midgeville, Georgia over the next couple of weeks. AOPA announced that the Air Safety Institute has canceled all of their in-person safety seminars. However, as of this writing, they had not canceled their in-person flight instructor refresher courses. The Air Safety Institute in-person FERCs will continue as scheduled, they say, but participants are encouraged to check the website regularly for updates on the status of those classes. And I would point out that there are a number of different companies which offer online alternatives to the in-person FERCs. So flight constructors may want to consider those as an alternative. And also from AOPA, they are encouraging the FAA to provide relief on a number of fronts, and they listed some of the issues that pilots are encountering. One challenge confronts CFIs. Our certificates expire every 24 months, and we have to renew them via one of 10 different methods. And that has to happen within the 90 days prior to the expiration date. Now, I mentioned some of the online courses that are available, but essentially what they're going to ask the FAA is to see if they can provide some extensions to the expirations of CFI certificates. They said that some existing problems will also be exacerbated, dealing with limited availability of DPEs, designated pilot examiners, to conduct practical tests. That's been a problem for more than two years, and of course, this is now a new obstacle. The FAA is considering waiving some DPE management policies. By the way, there have in the past been limits to the number of check rides that DPEs could give. And they note that some DPEs have canceled appointments with test applicants because of the outbreak of coronavirus. And as a result, applicants may run into the issue of not being able to complete their practical within the required time limits. And those time limits, by the way, would include, for example, the endorsement from your instructor that says that they have flown with you for three hours within the past 60 days. And another one, which is coming up next here, is Airman Knowledge Test. They are valid only for two years from the date they are taken. And if knowledge tests were to expire with testing facilities still closed, 
applicants would have no way to retake those knowledge tests, leaving them ineligible for the check ride. Reduced access to aircraft and CFIs could affect pilots' livelihood and the ability to exercise their privilege by triggering a wave of expiration of instrument proficiency checks, flight reviews, and recency of experience intervals, unless the FAA can make some exceptions. And there's the issue of medical expiration dates. Now, the AOPA says they expect to hear something from the FAA soon, but thus far there has been no word from the FAA about extending the expiration date of medicals. They're only stating that they still need to be done face-to-face and recommending that CDC guidelines be followed during the pre-screening. Now, here's a separate story. It says that Transport Canada has already announced that all medicals are now valid until at least August 1st, which seems like a pretty good move. And they also mentioned that aircraft maintenance and continuing airworthiness requirements must also be addressed. From the WashingtonPost.com, the FAA says 11 air traffic control facilities affected by the coronavirus. The FAA said over the weekend that 11 of its facilities nationwide have employees who have tested positive for COVID-19. They include the New York Center on Long Island, which handles, of course, a large chunk of airspace, the control towers at JFK International and LaGuardia in New York, as well as uh, at executive airports in Leesburg, Virginia and Long Island, and facilities in Peoria, Illinois and Wilmington, Delaware. These are in addition to previously reported cases that closed towers in Las Vegas, Chicago and in the Indianapolis Center. Widespread disruptions were seen over the weekend after an air traffic control trainee and others in New York tested positive. The FAA said it was not specifying the total number of employees infected because the numbers keep changing. And the FAA Administrator Steve Dixon is under self-quarantine after having a brief interaction with Representative Mario Diaz-Ballart of Florida, who had tested positive, and that occurred during a House hearing earlier this month. Well, on the bright side, there are a number of different things that you can do, some of which are free. This comes from erau.edu, that's the Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. They're offering two free online courses to students and the public who are limiting in-person social interaction during the coronavirus. Topics range from aeronautics and meteorology to computer applications, history, and more. And separately, all high school juniors and seniors living in the states of Florida and Arizona are being offered seven free for credit online courses through the Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. For students to qualify for these courses, they need to enroll no later than March 27th, which is right around the corner, and they must have a GPA of 2.75 or higher. You can find out more at news.erau.edu, and of course, we'll have a link to that in the show notes. And from our friends up at ASA, effectively immediately until May 31st, their Prepware School, which is regularly $295, will be offered to qualifying schools for free and Prepware Online, regularly $39.95 for any student database, has been reduced to $19.95. They also say that $100 has been taken off the online ground school courses for the private pilot online ground school. That brings the cost down to $79.95. And the instrument pilot online ground school has been brought down to $99.95. So this is really an excellent time to start taking some online ground schools. And Glime Aviation just announced in an email that they have partnered with Laminar Research to provide an introductory version of the Glime X-Plane flight training course and the full version of X-Plane 11 for a limited time at absolutely no charge. You can find out more about this on their website at glime.com. From kansas.com, Textron furloughs 7,000 Wichita workers and struggles with coronavirus. Textron, who of course is the maker of Cessna's Beechcraft and Hawker aircraft, announced mass furloughs company is one of the largest employers in the city and the state, most of it at the large East Wichita facility. The furloughs will be mostly U.S.-based employees. Each furlough will last four weeks, but the furloughs will be staggered starting March 23rd and going through May 29th. Spokesperson Sarah White said, this allows us to do our part in mitigating and containing the spread of the COVID-19 through social distancing while continuing to support our customers. The company also said it will be adjusting production to meet dropping demand for aircraft. It's the latest in a run of bad news for workers at Wichita's aircraft plants. Furloughs follow hundreds of layoffs at the end of last year at Textron, the second largest company in the city with roughly 9,500 employees. Those layoffs, mostly engineers and other professionals, were attributed to the completion of design and testing of Cessna's Citation Longitude business jet. And those layoffs were in addition to the loss of 2,800 jobs at Wichita's biggest employer, Spirit Aerosystems, 
which had to cut production dramatically due to the worldwide grounding of the Boeing 737 MAX jetliner after two deadly crashes. Spirit makes the 737 MAX fuselages and has dozens mothballed on the tarmac at Air Capital Flight Line, waiting for Boeing to resume production. From FlyingMag.com, this is from earlier in the month. Massive damage left in the wake of Tennessee tornadoes. An outbreak of severe weather left a wake of devastation, causing widespread damage around the Nashville metro area, including significant damage at the John C. Toon Airport. That's KJWN. The airport was closed to the public, according to the airport website. Many hangars and aircraft have been destroyed and power lines are down. The airport authority has activated an emergency response center to manage the assessment and immediate needs. Video shared on social media showed collapsed hangars and piles of aircraft tumbled together, creating a stunning scene. Local news outlet WKRN reported the airport officials estimated damage to be in the millions of dollars, clearly many millions, judging by the scale the damage left in the tornado's wake. Damaged aircraft have also been reported at Lebanon Municipal Airport. Of course, the human toll has been much greater, with 22 people killed. The storm's strength has been classified as an EF-3. And from photos I've seen, I could see at least two or three vision jets that were uh, mangled in the wreckage there. So a lot of valuable aircraft have been lost. Well, let's turn to some good news. This comes from AOPA.org, GA Aviation Award recipients for 2020 named. Catherine Cavagnaro of Sewanee, Tennessee, who is, by the way, one of our Patreon supporters, was named the 2020 National CFI of the Year. Cavagnaro owns and operates Ace Aerobatics School in Suwannee and is widely regarded as an expert in spin recovery and avoidance and upset recovery techniques. Cavagnaro is a regular contributor to AOPA Pilot Magazine and a speaker at AOPA's regional fly-ins. She is a professor of mathematics and former chair of the math department at Suwannee, the University of the South, where she developed and implemented courses in aerodynamics, differential equations, and mathematical modeling. She also serves as the lead representative for the FAA FAST Team Safety Team, at the Nashville Flight Standards District Office and was honored as the 2018 FAST Team Rep of the Year. She is also a designated pilot examiner. Other awards announced were Dennis Walter of Cincinnati. He was named the 2020 Aviation Technician of the Year. And Gary Brossett of Midland, Georgia. He'll receive the 2020 National FAA FAST Team Representative of the Year Award. So congratulations to all three of them. And from simpleflying.com, there's a new flight school for women who want to tackle the pilot shortage. In a bid to encourage more women into aviation, entrepreneur Aaron Lear is launching a pilot's academy run by Women for Women. Lear Academy features a co-ed training program, but with a strong focus on recruiting more female pilots due to the current disproportion in the aviation industry. The pilot industry is not only aiming to break down gender barriers, it's also keen to be kind to the environment too. And if you recognize Aaron's last name, Aaron Lear, she is the grandchild of William P. Lear, who is inventor of the Learjet. Lear Academy is also working in tandem with George Bai of Bai Aerospace. Mr. Bai is the inventor of the all-electric e-flyers and the Envoy, which will be in use at the school. Flight School has a launch date of June 2020 and will be taking early deposits for tuition to secure a place in line at the Academy. It's currently seeking investors and partnerships with those who share their vision with a view of expanding Lear Academy around the world. And separately, I looked it up. They're going to be located in Los Angeles, California. So it's going to be a, an electric airplane pilot academy. From ADN.com, Alaska's high rate of aviation crashes warrants a broad federal safety review, says the NTSB. Alaska needs a comprehensive review effort to improve aviation safety because its aviation fatal and non-fatal accident rates are far higher than the national average, the NTSB said. They issued a safety recommendation to the FAA calling for the formation of a group focused on safety to better review, rank, and integrate Alaska's unique aviation needs into the FAA's safety enhancement process. Alaska's aviation accident rate was 2.35 times higher than the rest of the nation from 2008 through 2017. The fatal accident rate in Alaska was 1.34 times higher than the national average according to NTSB statistics. Aviation safety in Alaska has been an ongoing concern for the NTSB. The board in August 2017 met in Anchorage in a rare investigative hearing held outside Washington, D.C. to increase awareness of controlled flight into train accidents in which an airworthy aircraft has flown unintentionally into the ground or water. Alaska also lacks infrastructure that's routine in other parts of the country, including technology that can provide certified weather information. Without certified weather information, flying under IFR is prohibited, and must be conducted under visual flight rules. Testimony at the 2017 hearing 
indicated that pilots sometimes turn off an airplane's terrain avoidance and warning system to avoid repeated alerts or hard warnings when an aircraft drops to 700 feet or below. According to NTSB Chairman Walt Sumwalt, all pilots must deal with Alaska's challenging geography and weather. We need to give them all the tools and resources to do so safely. Separately, it notes that the FAA has deployed 230 weather cameras throughout Alaska, providing pilots with visual weather information and updates every 10 minutes. The FAA continues to work with the National Weather Service to increase coverage of AWOS stations and forecast programs for 157 Alaska airports. And I also saw a separate story that the FAA is looking to bring weather cameras to Colorado. From AINonline.com, the FAA steps up illegal charter clampdown. The FAA has significantly stepped up its campaign to stamp out illegal air charter, but Randy DeBerry, manager of the South Carolina FISDO, warns that much more needs to be done, and what he has seen in the field is frightening. DeBerry gave an overview of ongoing efforts during the Air Charter Safety Foundation's 2020 Air Charter Safety Symposium, crediting the efforts of his team and of industry stakeholders, including the National Air Transportation Association, in spreading the word to educate about what constitutes legal and illegal activity. His interest peaked when, after first taking the manager's role at the South Carolina FISDO, he found the leading complaint from operators was their inability to compete against local illegal operations. One thing I found alarming was what I didn't know, he said. When he began looking into activity, he found that in South Carolina, illegal activity was fairly rampant. He discovered some airplanes with anywhere between 40 to 100 dry leases, a clear indicator that something is not right. DeBerry said he reached out to airport and FBO managers throughout the state, anyone who would listen, in this educational campaign and has been distributing posters on the subject. Those meetings initially in South Carolina have begun to spread throughout the country, and DeBerry stressed that the FISDO managers are now talking to each other. A slate of future meetings on the issue is being organized throughout the U.S. Paul DeLura, assistant manager for the FAA's Special Emphasis Investigations team, urged the audience to reach out with as much information as possible to enable FAA investigators to track down illegal activity. DeBerry agreed, saying one of the problems is the reticence of operators to provide much information. But he said his office takes every tip seriously. One of the first it received included only a tail number, and that is still an open investigation. One area the agency is paying particular attention to is online. Social media solicitations and apps, Delora said, noting that some operators hide behind the app. He says, we're watching them. And finally, from NBCSanDiego.com, man arrested for allegedly shooting at a San Diego police helicopter. Stories like this drive me nuts. A gunman was arrested on suspicion of attempted murder after he was accused of shooting a rifle at a San Diego Police Department helicopter in the Bird Rock community, police said. At about 10.15 p.m. on a Friday night, police received a call about a possible burglar. Residents said a man armed with a gun was banging on their door and making rambling statements. A police helicopter arrived in the area. As it circled the area, David Lowe, 46, allegedly fired one round at the aircraft. Fearing for their safety, the pilot climbed to a higher altitude and broadcast his actions. Then Lowe allegedly fired a second round at the copter. Officers arrived on scene and arrested Lowe without incident. The helicopter was not hit and no one was injured. In addition to the rifle he reportedly used to shoot at the police helicopter, officers recovered a shotgun, other firearms, and several rounds of ammunition. Lowe was booked into county jail on suspicion of two felony counts of attempted murder and three felony counts of assault with a firearm on a person, in addition to other charges. Homicide detectives are investigating the incident to try to determine Lowe's motives. And that's the news for this week. Coming up, my weekly updates. And then we'll get to our main topic on wind shear. All right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. Well, let's start things off with a fun flying destination. This comes from Patreon supporter Brian Carlson. Hi, Max. I'd like to share with you and your listeners a fun flying destination over here on the East Coast of the United States. Spring is coming, and a lunchtime trip to Tanger Island Airport, Kilo Tango Gulf, India, is a fun day trip. Tanger Island is in the Chesapeake Bay, a small historic island which is gradually disappearing because of rising sea levels. Tanger Island can only be reached from the mainland of Virginia or Maryland by ferry or by airplane. The airport, KTGI, has a 2,400-foot runway that runs roughly north-south. 
The asphalt is serviceable and 75 feet wide, and there's no fuel or services. In our Cirrus SR22, this runway is shorter than, than our normal minimum. We only do it if conditions are severe VFR and our approach is spot on. I'm based at KJYO in Leesburg, Virginia. So a trip to Tangier means either going west around the Washington DC Special Flight Rules Area, the SFRA, or flying through the SFRA with a clearance from Potomac. In that case, we use the VFR flyway between Baltimore, BWI, and Washington, DCA airports. In the latter case, be careful to stay under the Bravo and keep to the reversed VFR altitudes between the fixes VPonics and VPoop. I strongly recommend that before the trip, you take the required FAA online course for flying VFR within 60 nautical miles of the DCA VOR and through the SFRA. We fly right over the U.S. Naval Academy at Annapolis and see the sailboats on the Severn River. We exit the SFRA at Paleo Gate over the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, request flight following from Potomac, and turn south down the Chesapeake Bay. You will see dozens of huge cargo ships steaming up and down the bay. From here, your main concern is the restricted airspace over the Chesapeake Bay and the Delmarva Peninsula. Tanger Island itself is under a restricted area, but the floor of that area starts at 3,500 feet, giving you plenty of room to fly under it. I always check with either Patuxent Naval Air Station or Washington Center on whether or not the restricted areas are active. The runway at Tanger used to be longer, so landing to the north, remember, right traffic for runway 02, you can benefit from an extra strip of decaying concrete. Once you've landed and parked, don't forget to put $10 in the honor system box that goes for repairs to the runway. Walk on the path across the marsh to the town of Tanger. Tanger Island is a charming little fishing village that harkens back to its colonial era roots with friendly people who still speak with an old English accent that stems from their isolation. There are several casual restaurants serving fresh soft shell crab and other local delicacies. As you stroll around, you will see and appreciate a little bit of life in a small bay town. There are no cars and only a few electric golf carts and bicycles for transportation. But the island is really so small that you can walk from one end to the other and survey it all with no difficulty in your short stay. You'll get glimpses of life in America as it used to be. Now, don't count on a lot of cell phone service, and remember that the runway has no lights. Also, keep an eye on the weather. The Chesapeake Bay is famous for late afternoon summer thunderstorms that roar down the bay without much warning. But after all that, Tanger Island is a great destination, one that confirms what general aviation can do for us. GA takes us to places few others get to go, it shows us interesting sights, and it sharpens our skills every time. Thanks, Max. Well, thank you, Brian. Great job. And I'd like to ask anyone who's got a favorite airport that they would like to talk about to please take just a few moments to send us a recording like Brian did. Two easy ways that you can do it. You can go out to our webpage at aviationnewstalk.com, click on listener question at the top, and you can record for 90 seconds and tell us about your favorite fun flying destination. Or you could record just using the Voice Memos app on a smartphone and then email it to me at aviationnewstalk at gmail.com. A couple other things about uh, Tangier Island. I remember them from a couple of articles that I had seen in AOPA about a doctor who would fly out there in his helicopter to provide uh, services. I just went out to uh, look up. Apparently, he has passed away. They recently put up a memorial for him. But I put a link to that in our show notes if you want to read about the doctor, his 30 years of flying his helicopter out to provide a medical services there. Just 600 people on that small island. And also, I just ran across this, which came out two days ago from AOPA. They say that you should probably avoid Tangier Island for the next couple of weeks if possible. Mark Flynn of the Virginia Department of Aviation is working to ask pilots to avoid Tangier Island in Virginia for now. They say this isolated island village in the Chesapeake Bay is isolated from the rest of the world and thus far has not had any known exposure to COVID-19. Of course, they've got very limited medical facilities there, so they're hoping that nobody brings the virus to the island. And I wanted to let you know that I just created a Facebook page that's dedicated to the Aviation News Talk podcast. Would love your help in liking that page. You can find it by going out to Facebook slash Aviation News Talk. And of course, we'll 
post all our new episodes and other information there. So thanks for helping us out by liking that page. As you probably know, I've been sheltered at home now for just over two weeks as I decided to stop teaching about a week before there was a mandatory shelter at home order issued for the San Francisco Bay Area last week and then later for the entire state. And if you're wondering why I chose to do that, well, to me, it's kind of like the risk management that I do when I'm flying. If I'm in any situation where the data is uncertain, I always try to pick the most conservative option available to me. So that's why I'm at home. The good news is I am making progress on a number of projects that I've been working on. (laughs) The bad news is I've already picked up a couple of pounds, so I need to go out and get uh, some more exercise. I want to let you know about a couple of videos that uh, I have seen recently. You may have heard of a documentary called Above and Beyond that was produced by uh, Nancy Spielberg. She's the youngest sister of Steven Spielberg, and it documents the story of four uh, pilots, uh, Americans and Israeli pilots who flew warplanes to help defend this new state of Israel during its uh, declaration of independence back in 1948. And I knew that jogged uh, my memory. And so I went back and checked and yes, sure enough, we interviewed one of those pilots, Harold Livingston on the airplane geeks podcast back in episode 348. So I'll include a link to that in the show notes, but I definitely recommend above and beyond if you're looking for a good DVD to watch. Also on podcasts, I've listened to a couple of episodes of the happiness lab podcast which has done some bonus episodes on ways for people to deal with anxiety they may have about the coronavirus, and I'll include a link to that in the show notes. And I want to tell you about two new books that have just come out. These are by Jason Blair. Now, he is a pilot examiner, a DPE, who we've had on the show numerous times. Most recently, in episode 139, he gave me a mock private check ride. So if you didn't hear that episode, you may want to check it out. The two new titles are Buying an Airplane, which is 160 pages long, sells for $12.95, and Owning an Airplane, 216 pages long, also $12.95. And I want to thank Jason for sending me copies of the books. These are great. If you'd like to get copies yourself, they are fairly inexpensive. Just go out to ASA2Fly. That's the number two, ASA2Fly.com, and you'll see them featured there. And I just read a few minutes ago that there's a new 3D approach preview feature in ForeFlight that lets you fly an instrument approach without leaving your couch. So you may want to check that out. Go ahead and update your ForeFlight. I haven't seen it yet, but it certainly sounds pretty neat. Also, just a few minutes ago, I saw an interesting graphic from healthweather.us. This is really remarkable. It collects people's temperatures through a network of smart thermometers. I didn't even know there was such a thing, but for about $21, I guess you can buy a thermometer. When you take your temperature, that data gets aggregated across the country and they can plot the current number of fevers versus the expected number of fevers for this time of year uh, by county. So biggest differences I saw, California, far fewer fevers than average. And the worst in the country, Florida, with far more fevers than average. But you want to find out what's going on in your particular county. They've got all 2,000, what is it, 79 counties in the U.S.? I can't remember the exact number. But you can just click on your county on the website to see the data. Uh, I was happy to see that for Santa Clara County, we show a huge decline, which tells me that this sheltering at home really does work. So again, that's at healthweather.us. Now, about a week after I began sheltering at home, my flying club closed their doors completely for one week. And this week, they announced that they're reopening with a skeleton crew of three people, which they said would be largely operating out of sight behind the scenes. And for this week, they're only permitting solo operations. Next week, they'll begin permitting dual, though that data could change based on how things go this week. And to help with cleaning the planes, they're only going to permit one flight per day. When possible, they say they'll wipe down the plane interior with manufacturer-approved products. Avionics, especially glass cockpits interiors, they say can be severely damaged by alcohol or ammonia-based wipes and similar products. I think I may have mentioned this before. Definitely do not put anything on the G1000 or other displays unless it is intended for cleaning uh, glasses, eyeglasses with anti-clair coatings. Any type of eyeglass cleaner with an ammonia in it is going to strip that coating right off, so you don't want to do that. I also had an email from another club that's run by a friend of mine at a different airport. Some of the differences there, he says, there will be no food available in the lobby anymore except for coffee. They say that commonly touched surfaces and door handles will be cleaned twice daily. They also, of course, say if you experience symptoms that are similar to the flu, including fever, cough, shortness of breath, stay home, don't come to the club, and seek help from your doctor, which, of course, is good advice whether you're going fly or not. 
I also saw an email from Cirrus, and I think this probably applies to all aircraft. They say, while we confirm alternate cleaning solutions, ideal for disinfecting the surfaces in your aircraft, we encourage you to reference Section 8 of your Pilot Operating Handbook as the best resource for cleaning your aircraft. Highlights from applicable sections are included below, but ensure you reference the full document for all details. Now, here's an important point. They say, please be aware that the use of standard cleaning products particularly those traditionally relied upon as disinfectants, can be damaging to the interior of your aircraft. We do not recommend the use of jellied alcohol, for example, hand sanitizers, or any alcohol or ammonia-based cleaners or other commercial available disinfectants for the cleaning of your aircraft. Now, I had someone ask me just a couple of days ago if I thought it was okay for him to go fly his airplane. I told him I thought that a solo flight or a flight with family members that you're sheltering at home with, to me, is no different than taking a walk out uh, in your neighborhood. So yes, go have fun, fly your airplanes. Personally, for now, I'm not giving dual instruction. I've seen one club that has said that they don't believe it's permitted under the current order. For me, it's just not worth the risk of giving the coronavirus to a client or of catching it from them. And here in my county, where we have about 400 cases, over half the people in the hospital with the coronavirus are under the age of 60. So again, just like risk management, pick the most conservative option available to you. Now, changing gears, I saw a note on CirrusPilots.org about an avionics theft that I want to share with you. This gentleman's plane was in Tampa for some avionics upgrades. He said that the shop discovered that it was missing my two GTN 650s, GTX 345, FS 510, and a pair of A20 Bose headsets. The plane was locked, but someone either jumped the fence or flew in late at night and grabbed the stuff that was easiest to get out of the plane. They apparently had keys to fit as nothing was damaged getting into my plane. In discussing with the claims adjuster, I was told not to expect to see my avionics again. There have been a rash of aircraft break-ins and avionics thefts in Florida over the past several months. Now, that was news to me. The adjuster suspects that my avionics were likely already in South America, and that if they failed, they would never find their way back to Garmin, but instead would just be trashed. And I want to follow up on some of our discussion on wake turbulence from episode 138, when I mentioned that I got hit while I was in a vision jet following a 767 into San Jose, within just the next week or two, I encountered two opportunities to take some additional steps to avoid wake turbulence. In the first case, we were flying into Sacramento Metro Airport, and we were five miles in trail of a 737, and so this time we purposely stayed high above the glide slope to avoid their wake turbulence. And in the second case, I was getting vectored onto the ILS at Stockton, and I asked to be taken through the localizer behind a 767. And I had been monitoring his altitude on my traffic display, and I could see that he was very high above the glide slope as he was coming on a visual approach. ATC said he was 10 miles away, but I could see from the display he was actually a couple miles closer to that. And so I asked to be taken through the localizer, which they did, which gave us some extra spacing by the time we were brought back onto the localizer. And a lot of you took time to write to me about your experiences with wake turbulence, and I want to thank you very much for doing that, and I will read some of those notes in the feedback section, which we'll get to shortly. Speaking of other people I'd like to thank, I'd like to thank everyone who supports the show via Patreon or PayPal. If you wonder why I mention this at every show, well, this is a listener-supported show. At this point, we don't take any outside advertising, so I'd work for your tips, (laughs) and I really appreciate it when you let us know that you're enjoying the show by signing up to give us a monthly donation with your credit card via Patreon or PayPal. You can also make one-time donations through uh, PayPal. It's really easy to do. There are links in the show notes to do it. All you need to do is open a web browser and type in aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome. Since you're all awesome listeners, that will take you to the Patreon site or type in aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal. And of course, depending on what level you uh, donate, you will get a number of goodies from me. We've got all kinds of goodies starting at the $4 level and all the way up through the $50 level where I'll be mailing out autograph books to people who sign up for that particular level. And speaking of that, we have three new mega supporters in the last month. These are folks who donate more than $50 a month. They include Joseph Sheehan, Josiah Freeman, and Dylan Caldwell. I want to thank them all very much for becoming new mega supporters. And other new Patreon supporters include Tim Decker, Todd Boyland, Mike D, Joe Newman, who edited his pledge up to $8 a month, Thomas Matthews, Todd Martin, who edited his pledge up to $8 a month, Krish Baduru, Kenneth Coles, 
Sasha Solvensky, Ethan Jones, Craig Fisher, and Trent Taylor. And we also have a new supporter on PayPal, Patrick Tully, who signed up for $10 a month. And we also have some new one-time donations through PayPal. Now, some people like to send a lump sum for the entire year rather than doing it monthly. And we have a $500 donation from an anonymous donor who has contributed in the past. And I want to thank him very much. And Chris uh, Bruccini sent us $75. And I spent some time talking with Chris on the phone about one of the questions that he had. So happy to help him out. Now, I mentioned all of our mega supporters on all the news shows. And they include Brian Deere, who lives here in Northern California. He recently acquired a Turbo 206. Tyson Weiss, co-founder of Forflight. Victor Vogel, who lives in central PA and flies a Cirrus. Tim Delaney, flying for 50 years and flies an SR-22 in Northern California. Stephen Elop, who flies a Turbo 182 and a Citation CGA3+. He's the CEO of API Jet. Mike Williams, he's the president of Keomac and TCB Composites, makers of composite spinners and bulkheads for GA aircraft. Seth Lake, he's a new DPE giving check rides, specializes in teaching the multi-engine rating in the beach travel air. You can check out his website at vsl.aero if you'd like to travel to Arkansas to work with him. Rick Miller, he's a CFI, he instructs in the Cincinnati area, both out of the Lunkin Flight Training Center and also with individual owners who fly Pipers, Cessnas, Beechcraft, and Cicadas. Says he'd like to teach full-time, but still has that day job for a few more years. Justin Winter, who brokers real estate on Lake Kiowee in South Carolina and flies an SR-22. Carl and Ann Rossi of Maine Kuncat Aviation, who own and operate three Cessna T240s. Johnny McDade, who is a singer, songwriter, musician, and record producer. Jim Goldfuss, who's just returned from a hiatus in flying and working to get his CFI and double I. He says he'd like to teach full-time on Long Island. Charlie Mason flies out of Santa Monica. He's just coming back into flying after being out for a while. He just got checked out in an SR-20. Vincent Salimi, he's the council member for the city of Pinole. He's the owner of Salimi Construction Management in San Francisco. Stephen Smart flies a Pilatus PC-12 for a Part 135 air ambulance in Arkansas. He also flies a Piper Meridian in 210. Jim Hopp, one of our newest supporters. He is a flight instructor who I've known for quite some time, teaches at Advantage Aviation in Palo Alto, California. Lars Litchens, he's our youngest Patreon supporter. He flies a Redbird J Velocity Simulator, and he's looking forward to someday flying his dad's Cessna 205. Dad, by the way, sells boats in several Western states at boulderboats.com. Joseph Sheehan flew in the Navy for eight years and has been flying for the past years in an SR-22 and is just about to take delivery of a Vision Jet, so congratulations. Josiah Freeman, who's working on his instrument rating, and Dr. Dylan Caldwell, he's a new AME in Florida at the Naples Municipal Airport. So if you need a flight physical for basic meds, second class, or third class medical, you can contact him at aviatorsclinic.com. And I want to thank all of you who support the show in all the ways that you do, whether it's sending us email or telling your friends about the show. Coming up next, we're going to be talking about wind shear right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. Now let's talk about wind shear, which is a powerful force that has brought down dozens of airliners with a loss of many lives. Now, fortunately, we now know more about wind shear and techniques for avoiding it, but that wasn't always the case. Let me start by talking about the definition of wind shear, then give you a little history about past wind shear accidents, talk about some of the pioneering research in the late 1970s and into the 80s and 90s that gave us insight into these accidents. We'll also talk about how to report wind shear if you encounter it and a wind shear escape maneuver you should use if you find yourself in wind shear. Now, the FAA defines wind shear as a sudden, drastic shift in wind speed, direction, or both that may occur in the horizontal or vertical plane. Wikipedia gives a longer definition, which is wind shear, sometimes referred to as a wind gradient, is a difference in wind speed or direction over a relatively short distance in the atmosphere. Atmospheric wind shear is normally described as either vertical or horizontal wind shear, Vertical wind shear is a change in wind speed or direction with change in altitude. Horizontal wind shear is a change in wind speed with change in lateral position for a given altitude. There are a couple of different ways that wind shear can occur, and one of the most violent forms is that generated by a microburst. So let's talk first about an accident that kicked off much of the research into what since has come to be known as a microburst. This comes from an article in the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society. On June 24, 1975, Eastern Airlines Flight 66, a Boeing 727, 
crashed while attempting to land at New York's JFK Airport, killing 112 and injuring 12. While there were thunderstorms in the area, there was no understanding at that time of what may have caused the crash beyond speculation that it was struck by lightning. And just as background, the article is mostly about how Dr. Ted Fujita came to start researching downbursts and wind shear after this accident. He was a severe storms researcher, and he is best known for creating the Fujita scale of tornado intensity and damage. He also discovered downbursts and microbursts. The article says Fujita's involvement started when Homer Mulden, a former safety expert with Flight Safety Foundation, who was investigating the crash, became intrigued with the reported weather events of other aircraft landing and taking off near the accident time. Some of these planes reported little adverse weather, while others experienced hazardous winds. He approached Fujita with this information with the hope that he could unravel the mystery. Fujita recalled the very small-scale damage patterns he had observed in the wake of the super outbreak of tornadoes in April 1974. During his numerous aerial damage surveys, he not only observed the swirling patterns of downed trees associated with tornadoes, but Fujita also noticed strange starburst patterns of uprooted trees that indicated strong diverging winds. After analyzing the aircraft's flight data recorder, pilot reports, and an airport anemometer, Fujita hypothesized that Eastern Flight 66 had flown through a diverging wind system similar to, but weaker than those he observed during his analysis of the April 1974 starburst damage patterns. At the suggestion of his former mentor, Horace Byers, he termed this diverging wind system a downburst to capture the notion of a strong downdraft of air that burst outward on contact with the ground. Fujita defined a downburst as a strong downdraft that induces an outburst of damaging winds on or near the ground. He further subdivided downburst into microburst and macroburst according to their scale of damaging winds. He says that a damaging pattern less than four kilometers, which would be about two and a half miles, was defined as a microburst and greater than four kilometers a macroburst. Between 1976 and 1978, Fujita became involved in analyzing possible wind shear related accidents from all over the world. But because of the lack of detailed data, his analyses were subject to criticism. Accordingly, Fujita's downburst theory was met with some controversy in the scientific community. Now, in the article, the author's opinion is that many meteorologists did not appreciate the notion that a downdraft with horizontal dimensions on the order of a kilometer could descend almost to the ground before rapidly diverging outward as a strong horizontal wind. In addition, it was not understood that it was the center of the diverging outflow that was of greatest danger to aircraft and not the leading edge of the outflow. Fujita's analysis of aircraft accidents illustrated this point. Later, it was suggested to Vegeta that he use Doppler radar to verify the existence of downbursts. His first study in 1978 used three Doppler radars, which were set up west of Chicago. Shortly after the start of the field program, Fujita and one of the authors observed the first recorded microburst on Doppler radar in May 1978. After noticing a flashing of lightning southwest of the radar site, the antenna was rotated to scan that area. The Doppler velocity display showed a small bullseye pattern of rapidly approaching velocities centered five kilometers from the radar. Within minutes, as Fujita and the author stood outside looking for what they saw on the radar, a strong gust of wind almost blew them into a farm pond. With great excitement, they realized that they had observed the very first microburst on radar and had felt the diverging outflow. Fujita's analysis of the airflow associated with this microburst shows a downdraft a few kilometers wide that rapidly expands outward near the ground, very similar to what he had earlier hypothesized. The maximum horizontal velocity measured was 31 meters per second, which is about 60 knots, and that air was located less than 100 meters or about 300 feet above the ground. Fujita went on to do a number of other radar studies over the years, and as the author writes, in a period of only about 15 years, scientific understanding of the microburst evolved from no knowledge to a thorough understanding of the evolution of the downdraft and outflow and considerable knowledge of the forcing mechanism of the downdraft. Until 1985, the United States was experiencing a microburst-related wind shear accident on average every 18 months. But after this date, the next accident occurred nine years later in July 1994 at Charlotte, North Carolina. This dramatic turnaround can most likely be attributed to two major factors directed at reducing wind shear accidents, training, and instrumentation. Great article. And let's see, here's a look at what the Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge has to say on the subject. Wind shear is a sudden, drastic change in wind speed and or direction over a very small area. 
Windshear can subject an aircraft to violent updrafts and downdrafts, as well as abrupt changes to the horizontal movement of the aircraft. While wind shear can occur at any altitude, low-level wind shear is especially hazardous due to the proximity of an aircraft to the ground. Low-level wind shear is commonly associated with passing frontal systems, thunderstorms, temperature inversions, and strong upper-level winds greater than 25 knots. Wind shear is dangerous to an aircraft. It can rapidly change the performance of the aircraft and disrupt normal flight attitude. For example, a tailwind quickly changing to a headwind causes an increase in airspeed and performance. By the way, in that case, an increase in performance is likely to cause an aircraft to climb, and you can imagine what would happen as you fly into the outer edge of a downburst as your headwind suddenly increases rapidly. That sudden headwind increase will instantaneously increase the number of air molecules flowing from the leading edge of the wing toward the trailing edge of the back of the wing, and that generates more lift. Now, getting back to the pilot's handbook of aeronautical knowledge, conversely, a headwind changing to a tailwind causes a decrease in airspeed and performance, which of course means less lift, so the aircraft will most likely go down. In either case, a pilot must be prepared to react immediately to these changes to maintain control of the aircraft. The most severe type of low-level wind shear, a microburst, is associated with convective precipitation into dry air at the cloud base. Now, convective precipitation, of course, would be rain, snowfall, or even virga coming out of a cloud near a thunderstorm. You might ask, what is virga? Virga is a streak or shaft of precipitation falling from a cloud that evaporates or sublimates before reaching the ground. Now, if it reached the ground, it would, of course, be rain. If it doesn't, it's virga. Continuing on from the pilot's handbook of aeronautical knowledge, microburst activity may be indicated by an intense rain shaft at the surface, but virga at cloud base and a ring of blowing dust is often the only visible clue. So in the latter case, if you have just virga, rain is evaporating before it gets to the ground, but you can still have a microburst and a downdraft. And getting back to the text in the pilot's handbook, a typical microburst has a horizontal diameter of one to two miles and a nominal depth of a thousand feet. The life of a microburst is about five to 15 minutes, during which time it can produce downdrafts up to 6,000 feet per minute. <laughs> Think for a moment, can your airplane outclimb a 6,000 foot per minute downdraft? <laughs> no, that vastly exceeds the climb capability of most aircraft. In addition to 6,000 feet per minute downdrafts, you can also have headwind losses of 30 to 90 knots, seriously degrading performance. It can also produce strong turbulence and hazardous wind direction changes. During an inadvertent takeoff into a microburst, the plane may first experience a performance increasing headwind, followed by a performance decreasing downdrafts, followed by a rapidly increasing tailwind. This can result in terrain impact or flight dangerously close to the ground. An encounter during approach involves the same sequence of wind changes and could force the plane to the ground short of the runway. The FAA has made a substantial investment in microburst accident prevention. A totally redesigned LLWAS, that's low-level wind shear NE, that's a type of detection equipment, the TDWR and the ASR-9, which I believe is a radar system, are skillful microburst alerting systems installed at major airports. These three systems were extensively evaluated over a three-year period. Each was seen to issue very few false alerts and to detect microburst well above the 90% detection requirement established by Congress. Many flights involve airports that lack microburst alert equipment, so the FAA has also prepared wind shear training material, and that would be Advisory Circular AC-00-54, FAA Pilot Wind Shear Guide, which we'll read from in just a moment. Included is information on how to recognize the risk of a microburst encounter, how to avoid an encounter, and the best flight strategy for successful escape if you do have an encounter. It's important to remember that wind shear can affect any flight and any pilot at any altitude. While wind shear may be reported, it often remains undetected, and hence it's a silent danger to aviation. So we need to always be alert to the possibility of wind shear especially when we're flying in and around thunderstorms and frontal systems. And that's what it says in the Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge, which hopefully all student pilots are reading. Now, here are a few additional points from AC-00-54. During the period from 1964 to 1986, at least 32 accidents and incidents have occurred in which wind shear was identified as a contributing factor. These accidents and incidents resulted in over 600 fatalities and nearly 250 injuries. There's evidence to suggest that if undocumented close calls and GA statistics were included, 
these figures would be much higher. Examination of airplane accident and incident reports from 1959 to 1983 identified 51 wind shear-related events. 33 of these, or two-thirds, were related to convective storms. Seven were related to fronts, two to strong surface winds, two to unstable turbulent winds, and one to strong winds above a temperature inversion. There are two basic types of thunderstorms, air mass and frontal. Air mass thunderstorms appear to be randomly distributed in unstable air and develop from localized heating at the Earth's surface. The heated air rises and cools to form cumulus clouds. As the cumulus stage continues to develop, precipitation forms in higher portions of the cloud and falls. Precipitation signals the beginning of the mature stage and presence of a downdraft. After approximately an hour, the heated updrafts creating the thunderstorm are cut off by the rainfall. Heat is removed and the thunderstorms dissipate. Many thunderstorms produce an associated cold air gust front as a result of the downflow and outrush of rain-cooled air. These gust fronts are usually very turbulent and can create a serious threat to airplanes during takeoff and approach. Frontal thunderstorms, which are different from air mass thunderstorms, are usually associated with weather systems like fronts, converging winds, and troughs aloft. Now, these are the ones I think we're all familiar with where you'll see a long string of thunderstorms that will run sometimes almost all the way from north to south across the United States. Frontal thunderstorms form in squall lines, last several hours, generate heavy rain and possibly hail, and produce strong gusty winds and possibly tornadoes. The principal distinction in formation of these more severe thunderstorms is the presence of large horizontal wind changes at both speed and direction at different altitudes in the thunderstorm. This causes the severe thunderstorm to be vertically tilted. Precipitation falls away from the heated updraft, permitting a much longer storm development period, and this results in air flows within the storm to accelerate to much higher vertical velocities, which ultimately result in higher horizontal wind velocities at the surface. The downward moving column of air or downdraft of a typical thunderstorm is fairly large, about one to five miles in diameter. Resultant outflows can produce large changes in wind speed. Observations suggest that approximately 5% of all thunderstorms produce a microburst. Downdrafts associated with microbursts are typically only a few hundred to 3,000 feet across. When the downdraft hits the ground, it spreads out horizontally and may form one or more horizontal vortex rings around the downdraft. The outflow region is typically 6,000 to 12,000 feet across, so one to two miles across. The horizontal vortices may extend to over 2,000 feet AGL. Microburst winds intensify for about five minutes after ground contact and typically dissipate about 10 to 20 minutes after ground contact. It is vital to recognize that some microbursts cannot be successfully escaped with any known techniques. Note that even wind shears, which were within the performance capability of the airplane, have caused accidents. Microbursts have occurred in relatively dry conditions of light rain or virga, uh, which of course we said is precipitation that evaporates before reaching the Earth's surface. A typical example would be air below a cloud base, and that base could be up high as approximately 15,000 feet AGL, is very dry. Precipitation from higher convective clouds falls into low humidity air. It evaporates. The evaporative cooling causes the air to plunge downward. And by the way, evaporative cooling occurs Anytime a solid changes to a liquid or a liquid changes to a gas. And in that process, it removes heat from the surrounding area. And in the earlier article I read from, it said that microburst downdrafts will be even more dramatic if it's snowflakes that are falling into that dry air at the cloud base instead of rain. And that makes sense because snowflakes are a solid, so even more heat is removed than when a liquid changes to a gas. Now, going back to the advisory circular, as the evaporative cooling process continues, the downdraft accelerates. Pilots are therefore cautioned not to fly beneath convective clouds producing Virga conditions. Now, this is a very important point. If you see Virga, don't think, oh, hey, that looks like it'd be fun to fly through. <laughs> Instead, avoid the area where you see Virga beneath a cloud. The advisory circular also says the importance of avoiding severe wind shear and microbursts cannot be overemphasized. Microburst wind shears have been measured which are beyond the capability of transport category airplanes and the most highly skilled pilots. Wind shears which were within the performance capability of the airplane have caused accidents. Avoidance may only involve delaying departure or approach for 10 to 20 minutes since this is the typical time required for microburst dissipation. Even though significant emphasis on simulator training is recommended in pilot training curriculums, avoidance must be the first line of defense. 
Simulators are valuable for teaching wind shear recognition and recovery. However, pilots are cautioned not to develop the impression that real-world wind shear encounters can be successfully negotiated simply because they've received simulator training. In an airplane, complicating factors may make shear much more difficult than in a simulator. In addition, simulator motion systems are limited in their capability to reproduce all the dynamics of an actual wind shear encounter. Remember, some wind shears cannot be escaped using any known techniques. Therefore, avoid, avoid, avoid. Now, you might be wondering if you encounter wind shear, what words and phrases would you use to report wind shear? This comes from the Aeronautical Information Manual, Section 7-1-24, regarding wind shear pyreps. It says, because unexpected changes in wind speed and direction can be hazardous to aircraft operations at low altitudes, on approach to and departing from airports, pilots are urged to promptly volunteer reports to controllers of wind shear conditions they encounter. An advance warning of this information will assist other pilots in avoiding or coping with a wind shear on approach or departure. When describing conditions, use of the terms negative or positive wind shear should be avoided. And that's because in the past, pyreps of negative wind shear on final, which a pilot intended to describe a loss of airspeed and lift, were misinterpreted to mean that no wind shear was encountered. So don't use the phrase negative wind shear. Instead, the recommended method for wind shear reporting is to state the loss or gain of airspeed and the altitudes at which it was encountered. And here are some examples. Denver Tower, Cessna 1234, encountered wind shear, loss of 20 knots at 400 feet. Or Tulsa Tower, American 721, encountered wind shear on final, gained 25 knots between 600 and 400 feet, followed by loss of 400 knots between 400 feet and the surface. Pilots who are not able to report wind shear in these specific terms are encouraged to make reports in terms of the effect upon their aircraft. Here's an example. Miami Tower, Gulfstream 403 Charlie, encountered an abrupt wind shear at 800 feet on final, maximum thrust required. And they say that pilots with INS systems should report the wind and altitude both above and below the shear level. And if you're reading a TAFT, a terminal area forecast, those forecasts will include the letters WS, followed by the height of any wind shear, the wind direction and wind speed at the indicated height, and the ending letters KT for knots. Height is given in hundreds of feet AGL, up to including 2,000 feet. So, for example, if it said WS010 slash 18040KT, that would translate to low-level wind shear at 1,000 feet, wind 180 at 40 knots. And if you encounter wind shear, how do you escape it? Well, as we said before, the best thing to do is to avoid it altogether. But if you can't do that, then be familiar with the wind shear escape maneuver. Now, I've never seen one specified for any general aviation aircraft, but airline pilots now practice it in the simulator. And essentially, what you want to do is go to maximum power, pull up, use all the energy you have if needed, and don't make any configuration changes to flaps and landing gear. Now, here's some general guidance I found from a website called code7700.com. They say, and they gave many examples, but let's just pick this one for encountering wind shear during approach and landing. They also have it there if you want to go on the website for takeoff. But if you encounter wind shear during approach and landing, they say select takeoff go around mode and set and maintain maximum go around thrust. Follow the flight director pitch command if the flight director provides wind shear recovery guidance or set the pitch attitude target recommended in the aircraft operating manual. Be certain of your aircraft's flight director's capabilities. Not all are designed with wind shear and toga modes and may or may not be appropriate. If the autopilot is engaged and if the flight director provides wind shear recovery guidance, keep the autopilot engaged. Otherwise, disconnect the autopilot, set and maintain the recommended pitch attitude. Do not change the flap configuration or landing gear configuration until out of the wind shear. Level the wings to maximize climb gradient unless a turn is required for obstacle clearance. Allow airspeed to decrease to stick shaker onset or intermittent stick shaker activation while monitoring airspeed trend. Closely monitor airspeed, airspeed trend, and flight path angle. When out of the wind shear, retract the landing gear, flaps, and slats that increase the airspeed when a positive climb is confirmed and establish a normal climb profile. And to that, I'll add a final step, which is you can start breathing again. Well, there you have some things that you should know about wind shear. Coming up next, listener feedback right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. (music) 
And now let's get to some feedback. Had a lot of comments from you on episode 138 on wake turbulence. Frank in uh, the General Aviation Safety Group on Facebook said that BFU investigated a crash of a Robin following an AN2 departure. I wrote back, wow, excellent video. I don't think I've ever seen video of a wake turbulence induced crash. So I'll include that in the show notes if you want to see wake turbulence in action. From Ralph on Facebook, he said, nice message about wake turbulence. A new menace has appeared in my world recently, Prime Air's 767s. These are big, heavy, and are in a large pattern for KABE. Boy, I don't have to look that one up. That's the Allentown Bethlehem Easton Airport. I've flown to there in Pennsylvania before. He says a champ or cub flying at 2,000 feet AGL could easily get surprised by one of these freighters well outside the Class C airspace. And yes, we see uh, three 767s for Prime Air come into Stockton every afternoon. And that was one of the ones I mentioned earlier when I talked about uh, wake turbulence in this episode. From Paul in the COPA group on Facebook, he says, great timing. I just encountered this for the first time yesterday, coming in second behind an Embraer on final at Halifax International. The wings went full vertical to the right side, and it happened in a split second. I was 1,200 feet AGL. Thanks for talking about this on the podcast. From Jolie in the Private Pilots Club group on Facebook, I waited a few minutes after a Gulfstream departed yesterday. Also noted their liftoff and departure route, better safe than sorry. Yes, very, very true. From Sam in the Private Pilots Club group on Facebook, when I was training, a rather large executive helicopter cut me off in the circuit shortly after my right wing dipped drastically, essentially putting me in a 45 to 60 degree turn bank. That was one of the few times in my training that my instructor had to take control. That was the day I learned that helicopters are just as big of a weak turbulence threat as airplanes are. From Ken from the same group on Facebook, many times I've come up past Austin Bergstrom Airport in Texas on the west side then would cross over the path to 17 right in order to land on 17 left. A few times I'd cross over after an airliner went past on the approach to the right. Usually I never felt a thing, but a couple times, even a 737 would make a significant wake, and I'd feel quite a bump as it jostled me around that short bit. From Joey on Facebook, taking off in formation about 50 feet off the ground. I was in a jump plane taking off from Flagler. I was a jumper sitting with my back to the panel on the floor with the window at about eye level. We rolled right about 90 degrees. I could see the center line. The young jump pilot decided to meet the other 182 at altitude. He'd had enough formation flying. David says he's uh, had wake turbulence while at uh, Green Lake Hold on his way into Oshkosh in 2018. Tamara, helicopter wake turbulence got me once. Way more uncertain stuff. Urgen, I was in a 90 degree bank with full controls in the opposite direction and full power from 800 feet down to 300 feet AGL. Long time. That was in an Embraer 110 versus an A310. Boy, that sounds really scary. And Adam said during my private pilot training, we got hit by weak turbulence from an Army Apache helicopter. See if I grabbed the yoke, fought to keep us stable, learned a valuable lesson that I've carried with me. And this comes from Lee, who's a client of mine. He says, here's the backstory on the photo that I used to illustrate that particular episode. I read a little bit from it. It says the picture was taken during a NASA research program titled Aerial Applications Research. The red smoke screen through which the airplane flew was produced by igniting smoke bombs inside a length of hardware store gutter pipe, cleverly conceived by one of the researchers on the project. It took weeks of trial and error involving different colors of smoke and waiting for the perfect sky and wind to get the photographic conditions just right. And here's an email from Gary Reeves. He's the 2019 CFI of the year. He says, Max, hope you're well. I just got back from training some pilots in Australia and thought your listeners might like to hear five big differences about flying GA IFR down under. One, they don't do ILS. Two, what's for flight? Never heard of it. And and that's because there are other applications that are more popular there. Uh, Three, required to do an IPC with an examiner every 12 months. Four, don't really use airways. Everything is LNAV direct. Five, NDB is still commonly used approach. Well, thanks so much for that, Gary. And from uh, Patreon supporter Tim Sparks, he says, special VFR, I have used it several times. The last was a year or two ago when I was right seat in a 172 with a low time VFR pilot. Field was porting IFR, but the direction of flight was clear and low scud was in the area. But for the most part, we both thought we could stay VMC. And so at my encouragement, he requested special VFR. The tower controller knew the pilot and his experience level and told us that special VFR was for IFR-rated pilots. I guess he was trying to keep us from doing something dumb. 
That was some serious meddling. Yes, because that's actually not true. That's true at night, not true in the daytime. Uh, he continues, I came up on the radio and informed him I was IFR rated and other things, and he acquiesced to our request, and off we went for an uneventful flight. The Kobe Bryant accident is one that is so tragic and preventable. This is classic normalization of deviance. If you keep doing something of a reasonably high risk and successfully complete it, it makes it the new normal. I will bet that pilot had done the same special VFR countless times without any problem and completed the mission. This time the clouds were a little thicker and he mismanaged enough things that got out of control before he could gather them back into control. Aviate, navigate, communicate. Keep up the great program. Lots of food for thought. And from Patreon supporter Joseph Smith Stewart, he says, Max, I'm listening to your podcast 137 and got to the part about fuel personnel leaving the caps off of the tanks. I had a solo flight this past Saturday and called for fuel from the FBO's fuel truck as the tanks were a bit low. I always sump and dip the tanks after fueling, even though I had just sumped and dipped the tanks during my pre-flight. Although the fuel person did put the caps back on, I found they were not tight and turned all the way, and I only discovered this when I dipped the tanks after they were done. Keep up the good work. Well, thanks so much for that, Joe. And if you have any feedback you'd like to share, you can shoot me an email at aviationnewstalk at gmail.com. Also, one other way you can support the show I don't mention often enough if you have any interest in learning all the details about operating the Garmin G1000, even if you think you're an expert at it, you might want to have a reference to bring along with you in the cockpit. And that is my Max Truscott's G1000 in Perspective Glass Cockpit Handbook. Easiest way to order it directly from me, just call 800-247-6553. And I will mention there is a great index in the back, runs about eight pages long, so you can quickly look up just about any feature that you might be interested in. Also, check out our Patreon site and consider becoming a supporter of the show. I try to add a couple of new supporters every month because we lose a few supporters each month when people either don't update their credit card or they drop out because of changes in their finances. So if you find value in the show, just head on out to aviationnewstalk.com slash Patreon or aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome because you're all awesome listeners. So until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up. <laughs>